Hello, it's another day. It's Wednesday, Hebrew 6, and I'm excited to jump into the Word and ready. Are you ready? Grab a cup of coffee. Grab your Bible. Um, I know that many of you have mentioned that Hebrews is your favorite book. Um, you've also mentioned you don't think you understand it all. And um, some of you have said, man, this book so intimidates me and um, I feel like I don't really understand you know, the half of what the writer's trying to say, and that's okay. You know, I just want to encourage you, um, press in anyway, because um, it's in layers, right? Every time we read the Bible, we get what we get, and it's living, it's active, it does something in us. And the next time we read it, it does something else. It's, it's alive, right? It's the living Word of God. And so I just want to encourage you, press in, even if what you're getting is mostly from the commentary of what I'm sharing, because I don't get it all either, and I'm just getting what I'm getting this time around, so be encouraged. Good morning, David. Good morning, Trisha. Morning, Jen. Jen Fahrenheit. Morning, Heather. Morning, Raquel. Good morning, Olivia. Oh, Olivia's on this morning. Howdy. All right, Hebrews chapter 6. Shall we jump in? Do you remember what? Um, what the writer was talking about in Hebrews chapter five, right at the end. I can't wait for the can't wait for the to do a contest here. So I got to tell you, if you forgot, um, it's it's that it was that warning, right? After all of this talk about who Jesus is as the high priest, there's a warning in the um, the end part of chapter five, where the writer is saying, "Now don't be dull of hearing. You know, grow up so that we can move past." some of the elementary things into the deeper things, you know, grow up, don't be, throw off your dullness, throw off your distractedness, remember that? And so that's where we're picking up with Hebrews 6. Morning, Trisha. Morning, Marcia. Um, all right. Yay. Oh, good. Olivia's saying, finally making it back on, not getting discouraged. Morning, Elizabeth. Morning, ZZ. All right. Let's do it. Chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Did you guys just hear that? Here's this... Uh, uh, charged us, hey, grow up, you know, come, come, let's come out of the foundational things of God, the ABCs, basically, of the gospel. Let's move past the ABCs. And then this writer tells us what the ABCs of the gospel are. And I look at this list and think, what? I mean, we don't teach some of these things until somebody's, you know, three years in ministry school. Did you catch that list of things? Um, it says, one, repentance from dead works. That's number one. That's a foundational truth. Number two, faith towards God, right? Have you been instructed and is your foundation faith towards God? What about, number three, instruction about washings? When's the last time you heard a good message on that? Um, hmm. And yet this writer is saying this is foundational for us. Number four, this is the fourth foundational teaching. Are you ready? The laying on of hands. Interesting. What does that mean? The laying on of hands. That's foundational teaching. That's not a deep thing in God. That's a foundational thing in God. That's the ABCs of the gospel. The laying on of hands. You know, what do you think that means? Right in. Number five. Number five. Listen to number five. Resurrection of the dead. This is foundational. Is it your foundation? Resurrection of the dead. And number six, we would not put this as foundational. Number six is eternal judgment. The understanding, the doctrine, the foundational truth of eternal judgment. You know, some years ago, it's got to be probably close to, I think it's close to nine or ten years ago now. Man, time goes fast, right? I was reading Hebrews 6 all the way back then, and this list just, you know, just reached out and hit me on the head. I thought, What? This is the foundational um, doctrine of the, of the gospel? What? And so I did an entire teaching series um, on these six 
foundational truths and we went through one of them um, a week. So for one week we'd just talk about repentance from dead works. What does this really mean? Where do we see it in the in the Bible? Where Where is it that Jesus led us into this? Um, it's a foundational teaching. You can buy it, I think, on a or it must be on our Resound website, Resound 247, and it's called The Elementary Doctrines of the Faith. And remarkably, not too many people want to go purchase that. We want the deep things of God. We want to move, you know, past the, the yeah, 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 we know. You know, now tell us how to prophesy. Tell us how to do the deep things. We really need to make sure our foundation is right because everything else that builds on top of that, right, uh, if it's askew at all in the foundation, everything you build is going to be askew. I just challenge you to ask yourself, look at this list. I even put it in list form in the notes. Look at that and see, um, you know, do you, do you think this is something you understand, right? I, I don't know. It wasn't something I understood, right? I don't know that I had a firm foundation about the resurrection from the dead and how that fit in. So here's two what I would call end time points. And there, and this writer is saying that's foundational truth, right? And just like we've been talking about in this pattern of, yes, coming out of Egypt, but then there has to be a walking into the promised land. And look at that, number one and two, repentance from dead works, come out, but faith towards God. That's about the going in. Yes? See what you guys are saying? Oh, sorry, Elizabeth. She said she can't view for some reason. You know what? Just refresh your browser. I think that's what people have had to do on occasion. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Crystal. Hi, Juanita. Hi, Kathy. Um, hi, Sean. Sean had his 10-year anniversary for running a, an open mic, an open night mic down downtown Orlando. 10-year anniversary last night. We're so proud of you, Sean and Jana. It's just so awesome. Larry got a chance to be down there to celebrate just Sean's faithfulness, but it's not just faithfulness. There's so such fruitfulness in Sean and Jana's life. Um, so love you, Sean. Um, Jen saying, yes, repentance is huge. It changed my life. Right. I just kind of wonder, don't you? Like when you, well, we'll get into this in a minute. Let me just, we'll let the, we'll let the, the text take it, take us where we need to go. Okay. Um, Jen saying, I need more foundational understanding. I don't understand or have a revelation you are talking about in Hebrews. You mean this particular passage, Jen, or just you feel Hebrews is kind of going, wow, this is a little beyond me. The, I want to encourage you, if even hearing this list, you're recognizing now and it's like, oh, I don't know. I don't know much about this. Go to that Resound, um, go to the Resound website, check it out. If you don't want to pay for it all combined, there's a way to do it. Find our iTunes account, go to Resound Mission Space. You'll just have to do some searching and digging, but you could go through all of those teachings. You could find them all for free one at a time um, if you've got the time to do that. So uh, my heart is always... If I'm getting something, God, I want to share it. I'm not trying to, um, I never want, I feel like you can't charge for the gospel. I'm charging for the time it took somebody to put those teachings together in a CD box or whatever. But if you want to do that on your own, it, you can find it for free. Okay. Um, yeah. Jen saying, <laughs> yes. I'm not sure which of the yeses you're saying to this passage or Hebrews, but either way, uh, just, just pursue that, um, Spend some time and look at this list and ask, is this my foundation? Because I think some of the things we try and build on later when we don't have the foundation, right, we just, it just cannot come together, right? And um, I just want to point out, um, nowhere in this list is it mentioned about the prosperity gospel or grace. I, am I saying that grace is not part of the gospel message? No, I am. Um, am I saying that prosperity is not part of the gospel message? I am. What I'm saying is some of the things that get taught as foundational truths in some ways um, are taught in a, what I would call like a caricature of what the gospel, the good news message is. It's like we have these caricature artists all over town because we're a tourist town in Orlando. And you've, you've maybe seen them. It's where somebody's, you know, do an art on the street and they say, oh, I'll draw you and they draw you and whatever your kind of biggest feature is, maybe my nose, they would draw my face and blow my nose up so big and you'd still recognize it was me, but 
you know, it would be a caricature. It's taking one thing and blowing it out of proportion, right? And I think that sometimes what happens is we as pastors will pick our favorite thing that we like to, to preach, and we just preach that one thing. Over and over we preach that one thing, and we distort the whole picture of the gospel. And that's why I'm pointing you back to this. When I saw this list 10 years ago, it floored me because it wasn't my foundation. I had never heard anyone teach on some of these things, let alone I had not taught on some of these things. That was eye-opening for me. And it's one of those things that we want to get back into and say, wow, you know, I, I need to make sure I've got this all down pat. So be encouraged. It, you know, don't be discouraged when you're reading something and go, oh, I don't have that. Well, it's being pointed out to you so that you can get that. Yeah. Yeah, Jen's saying, yeah, this passage, probably more, but was referring to this, going to look for the series. Great. Jody's saying, great point about getting the foundational truths first. If the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do or the milk? But let's move on to maturity. Ask the question, what does that entail? Where were the Hebrews, Hebrew saints bogged down in the elemental truths and not moving into maturity, right? Or where they didn't have them at all. Trisha's saying, get bits and pieces of the puzzle, but having a hard time putting the pieces of, of the puzzle together in the right places. Right. Well, that's why we're doing it together. Really. That's why we do this together. It's, it's you know, to be honest, if you look at even how um, Jews celebrate, not just celebrate, study out the Torah, there's personal study, but there's a lot of time of, of corporate study. And that's what we're doing. We're looking into something together and I get my piece and I share it and you have your pieces and you share it. And together we have a more full picture of what it is the Lord is trying to release to us. Amen. So go back, look at that list. Be honest with yourself. Say, okay, I need to understand what number three is or number five is. Okay, so that, why? So that I can mature. If this is the foundation, the ABCs, I need to learn the ABCs so that I can mature in the deeper things that God wants to draw me into. Amen? Verse 4. Now this is going to be a challenge. Here we go. Verse 4. And I see you, Amy Petrie. I'm so happy that you're here. Say hi to everybody. Uh, or every, let's say, say Everybody say hi to Amy. We've missed you, Amy. Okay, verse 4. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away. It's impossible to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harb and holding him up to contempt, probably from other people is what they meant there. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for the sake it has been cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it's worthless and near to being cursed and its end is to be burned. Oh my. All right. Well, this is getting good now, isn't it? Um, This is a troubling passage of scripture to be sure. Because what the author seems to be saying is that if you've truly been, what we would maybe say in our language today, saved, if you've truly experienced God in the fullness of what that means, right? And then you fall away and then you reject him, you, you um, disregard him. What the writer is saying is it's basically the equivalent of re-crucifying him again and not just harming yourself, but you, you literally string him up there to the contempt of the world. Now, he's got to do it twice. This is a really daunting passage of scripture. And I felt like, um, you know, I give you my take. I don't often go into too many details about my story, but I'm worried that somebody would take this passage and go, man... Well, I feel cold and I feel like distant from the Lord. So maybe there's no point in me even going on because that's what I'm doing. And I just want to tell you, I don't think that's what this writer means. Um, I don't. Um, I think there's a reason the passage we just covered about foundational truths and then this passage comes right on the heels of that. And it's this, most people 
um, have never heard the foundational teachings of the gospel, right? I mean, I'm not saying that's you, but I'm saying, you know, how many people do you know that you feel like who've been saved a year, two years, three years, four years, 10 years, 20 years, have a firm grip on what we just covered in the foundational truths? Um, some people never really heard that they had to repent, right? So they were told, have faith in God. And they, they were doing step two, right? They were doing point number two, foundational truth number two, but they never heard foundational truth number one. And so what happens is they, ha they have faith in God for a minute, but they, they never understood that that wasn't the only part of the foundation, right? We come in first of repenting. We have to come out of Egypt before we can walk into the promised land, right? And so I just want to encourage you in some ways, um, I know this could look discouraging. I don't read it that way, and I'm trying to help you not to read it that way. Um, I think this is like, man, maybe I haven't tasted the fullness. When I, you know, and in that place of not tasting the fullness, the fact that I still waver maybe is because my foundation has never been right. Um, when I look at someone who tells me that they're a believer and they've been a believer for 10 years, 15 years, and then that person is caught in unrepentant sin. I mean, you can look at that life, you can watch that, that work life, that marriage, that parenting life, that whatever. You can look at all of these things and say, man, that entire thing is not working. You know, I don't look and say just, oh, that person's just weak. I look and say, I think there's something really off in the foundation of that person's um, faith, right? S something was off. If they're still caught in sin and there's no remorse and their conscience is seared as a believer, did the foundation get laid right to begin with about forsaking all and really leaving Egypt? That's kind of where I land. I was somebody who, you know, I gave my life to the Lord in the way that I could as a teenager. Um, you know, it was authentic for me for, for those moments. I loved the Lord, but I really wasn't discipled. And I, you know, I would read the Bible every day and, do, you know, I did that. But, but there were some things that were missed um, in how I understood the gospel, right? I, I didn't understand. I was reading as I was going and really trying to understand that. And I ended up going to university, and um, in that time, I was taking a bunch of religion courses, which I thought um, would benefit me. What I didn't understand is a lot of professors of religion in universities are, um, can be very, um, they're backslidden believers, right? They're not teaching to build the church. They're teaching in some ways to argue with with the church. And that was the case for me. Sorry. And, oh, I mean, my faith just got rocked. I would sit in those religion classes and I would say what I got, you know, what I was receiving or what reading the books and sharing what I got out of that. And I'd just get destroyed. I mean, these professors would heckle me and, you know, I didn't know enough. And, if somebody's outwitting you and they're outwitting you for the sake of trying to get you to curse God and you just feel like, I, I don't know. Um, and, you know, I was off by myself for the first time and being tempted and all sorts of things that I, I was, I was on my own in that respect. And I look at that and go, man, I can tell you, I fell away from God during those college years my mom and brothers and family prayed me back in, prayed and fasted for me one week, and something broke over my life. This was a year after I graduated from college, and man, God flooded into my room and came, you know, came and restored my life in, in a miraculous way, and I'll share that. Maybe I have already, um, but I say all that to say, do not think that if you have... Um, hardened your heart towards the Lord that you cannot be re-softened. That is ridiculous. And I don't think that's what this person is trying to say at all. I think the person is trying to say, if all of these foundational truths are right and active and laid right and perfectly in your life, and then you fall away, what is that? And I can say as somebody who's been walking for the, with the Lord now consistently for the last 20 years, I can tell you, um, yeah, as my foundation was being restored, 
There has been a steadiness in my life that I think anybody who knows me well would tell you, yeah, that lady's pretty steady. And it's not because I haven't walked through major stuff, because I have. Sometimes we see somebody walking steady and they, you go, oh, they don't know. They just don't know. They've never been tested. Friends, um, I have been, and, it, and you could ask anybody, anybody who's done life with me the last few years. It's not that it hasn't been tested. It's that the foundation, I feel like, is, is, has been laid rightly enough that I can keep coming back to those foundational truths when whatever's been built is being shaken. And sometimes the things we build on our foundations get shaken. Yeah? And, and that's life. And so, you know, I just want to encourage you, don't hear this as a closed door. It's not. If today you hear, uh, if today you hear his voice, that was earlier in the book of you, don't harden his heart. Yeah. So if today you hear the Lord calling you, hey, I love you. Let me reshape this foundation. Let me tear up what you've built on it. Let me pull it all out. Let me level the ground again, maybe, or level the ground for the first time. And let me rebuild for you, right? Be encouraged with that. That's not a punishment. That's a good thing. You want him to do that in your life. The pain is having to watch what you spent so many years building kind of coming toppling down. That's, that's painful. But, oh, it's so worth it, right? So worth it. I know you guys have been saying stuff and <laughs> see you guys saying hi to Amy. Um, Crystal saying, so deep, foundational, important to understand. Grateful for this today. Trisha, thank you. Um, thanks, Crystal. Trisha saying, so many blame others for their fall rather than admitting they're wrong because of pride. That's true. Not me. Mine was all my mistake. Jen saying, um, I've been a Christian my entire life, had some amazing experiences with God in my youth, but lived like hell, honestly. Yeah, right? How many of us can relate to that? It wasn't until I was bold with God and said I didn't understand his love, and he revealed to me that I saw my life transformed, but my foundation was Jesus died for you because you're terrible and a disgusting person because you sinned, not because he loved you and wanted to restore you into a relationship with him. Right. I get that, right? Um, there's all sorts of pitfalls in this. And because we, in some ways, get further and further away from just straight up Bible teaching, we, um, we miss out right? Because these kinds of things that we're talking about, let me be honest, from a pastoral perspective, they don't sell. People don't want to hear this. They want to hear, you know, whoever's coming in to give a prophetic word and all the, you know, I love prophecy, but prophecy has to come through and, and, and lay on, stand upon the foundational truths that we're talking about here. So, you know, most people go, I don't want to hear that. And so pastors don't teach it. Or maybe they don't know it. I don't know. But there's a reason why these things don't get, um, don't get dealt with. Uh, many times we desire a closeness with God, but fear repentance, especially doing it publicly. Every time I have found myself distanced from the Lord, I found release when I fall into my knees and repented. It's at that moment that I'm overcome with joy and truly felt the grace of our Father almost immediately. Yeah. And Olivia, I know you shared your testimony a few weeks back, um, but now you're even coming into a new season with this very testimony. And if you feel like you can later, I'd love for you to share that, you know, write it into the comments. I think it will encourage people um, because Olivia, I have known her for a short time, but I've loved watching her walk this very thing out, the very thing that we're talking about. So um, up to you, but I'd love for you to share that again. Emily saying, I'm listening now. Yay, Emily. Um, impossible. Jody saying, perhaps in the sense that it's impossible to cru crucify Christ again, not so much that the person can't repent and come back. Yes, hope abounds. Trisha saying, yes, Olivia and I agree. That's when I get my strength to get back up. Yes. And Olivia saying, absolutely, she will uh, share. Yes. So shall we keep on going? Yeah. Let's see. Verse 9. Verse 9. We're at verse 9. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust 
so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints, as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. All right, here's the same pattern, right? It's the same pattern again. We addressed this earlier in the book of Hebrews. We just talked about it a few minutes ago. It's coming out of Egypt or out of that life of sin for the purpose of coming into the promises of God, right? We don't want to live in that middle ground, so to speak. And I think that's where some of us have gotten caught and spent a lot of years, right? You come out of sin, but you've not yet entered into the promises of God. And that is a lot of people die there. Go back and read your Bible for for the first Exodus, right? A lot of people die in that desert place. And so we're not, we're not meant for that. And so this writer is now saying, listen, God is fair. He is just, he is loving. He is all of those things. He, he, and, and yet he's calling you to not be sluggish. Don't stop halfway. Keep going. Imitate those who not only came out of Egypt, look back at this passage, but who entered into the promise, right? And on a practical level, we can do that today right? Um, get an autobiography of somebody who you go, man, you know, they, they entered into something that in God that I admire, that I, I want to see in my own life. Um, I love reading, um, biographies. I just read a couple years ago, Reinhard Bonnke's autobiography like this thick. It's encouraging because you know what, for me, I look at that and go, okay, great. 74 million people saved. Wonderful. But you know, how do you go how do you go from from where where I might be and seeing my journey with stadium stuff? How do I go from that into the fullness of what Evangelist Bonke is seeing? And I think for me, looking at that and, and reading, he spent, I think it was like 10 or 20 years preaching just day after day. I mean, he had four people come into his church. I don't know about you, but I find that encouraging. Like, wow, okay. So keep at it right? Keep at it. That's one of the keys when you read these people's biographies. They kept at it. They didn't give up. Um, The first book I ever read as a Christian, I could highly, highly recommend this book to you, is a book called God's Generals. Um, It's the good, bad, and the ugly of of, um, looking at several different people's lives. I think it's 12 biographies. It's got Catherine Kuhlman in there, Amy Simple McPherson, I can't remember there's another woman in there, but I loved that. And as a brand new believer, looking at their lives and seeing, you know, how they're, how they all started out and then looking and saying, man, this person got off track. This person got off track, this person. And, but these people, they were able to go the distance and remain faithful to God. And that's what I want, God. And so I would get those biographies, you know, and read a whole book about John G. Lake and say, how did this guy, John G. Lake, Bless you until his last breath. God, that's what I want. And so you pick up these books and in a way they begin to mentor you into the journey that they walked through. Amen. Can we keep going? Verse 13, for when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things, what are they? In which it's impossible for God to lie. And that oath, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This writer is pointing back to Hebrews 5, finishing up. That whole thought, Hebrews 5 and 6 are a whole thought about Jesus being the high priest of our faith. Amen? Do you see the pattern? 
We come out of Egypt. We come out of sin. And there's more. We step into the promises of God. We step in to the relationship that is being offered to us in Jesus. Amen? We cut a relationship with sin and darkness, but that's not enough. We have to enter into the relationship that's being offered to us in Jesus. Amen? Uh, any comments here? A lot of the gifts, prophecy in particular, end up hurting people because the foundation is crooked. If you don't have a proper foundation, prophecy won't flow like it should. That's true. Um, Jen saying, that's me. I don't want to die there. Me neither. Be not slothful, David's saying. I think that's, you need to put your verses. David's always getting on me. Say your verses. Where, where he's reading a different translation. So uh, put your verse there. I'm sure it's tied to the don't be sluggish verse, but I'm just guessing. Uh, Zizi saying, yes, endurance. Guys, be encouraged. Amen? Be encouraged. If you find that you're one of those people and you continue to be stuck in sin, right? Um, this is good news. Because I think after a while, you just feel like giving up, like the God thing is not working for me. It's because of that foundation being off, right? I want you to be honest with yourselves and look into your heart, look into your life and say, have I really, have I really repented of this? Meaning said, I don't want this. I don't want this in my life. You've broken your relationship with that thing in a way that you're saying, I'm done with it. Has that ever truly happened for you? And if not, you need to ask the Lord, help me. Help bring me to a place of repentance, right? It's God's loving kindness that brings us back to those places. To ask the Lord, help me to do that. And then, and then enter in to the, to the new relationship that you have in God, the faith in God, right? Point number two, faith in God. Beginning that new relationship of restoration, um, there's better news than, um, you know, just being ashamed as a believer that we can't get free of sin. Now, that's a lie. We can be free of sin. Amen. We can be freed from the clutches of sin. Doesn't mean that we don't struggle. Doesn't mean that we're not tempted, but we can be free from it. Amen. There is a coming out that is promised to us. Come out of that and enter into the, to the good things that God has for you. Amen. Do you hear that? Jen's saying, I don't feel like I'm stuck in sin. I get stuck because I'm not entering in. Sure. How do I enter in? I'm declaring it is for me. I mean, you've got to make time to build a, a relationship with the Lord. I know that sounds really simplistic because it has become the cliche thing to say, right? It's not about religion. It's about relationship. Um, right. But how many of us have really cultivated that relationship, right? Right. And so it's part of it, it is low and slow. And I just want to encourage you, people don't love that message, especially in America. We have been conditioned, we want it now. Even the way sometimes we do altar calls is like, lay your hands on me and impart that thing that took you 20 years to get. And impart. I don't believe that's a possibility, right? We're, we're not um, given relationship by osmosis. You're introduced to Jesus. You're brought in to his presence um, but then you have to begin to build that relationship with him. And it is slow, just like any relationship, right? It is slow, but it is good. And so I would say just making time where um, you're letting him do most of the talking. Maybe this sounds really elementary. I don't know if this is what you're asking, but I'm going to answer it because I think not enough of us do this. Even with me, I get so busy with stuff. I'm so busy doing ministry that I forget to talk to the one who's the minister. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? But it's true. And so it's just making that time to hear him, to not go in with our list of stuff. We're asking him to bless. Not, no, just to be with him. Here I am, God. I, for me, I have to leave the house and go do a walk and say, God, here I am. If you want to talk to me about anything today, I just want to hear. It doesn't even have to be about me. Didn't have to have anything to do with me. God, I just want you to know I'm here. And, you know, you'll start to see your relationship with God build, right? I think um, so many times I've seen God thwart and frustrate even my ministry plans because in some ways we're pursuing ministry as an identity and we that's not a safe place. And God, because he loves us, goes, nope, 
nope, shutting that door, shutting this door, shutting this door. And it's all because I love you. I love you, right? You're going you're gonna to kill yourself trying to do stuff. And God's going, no, no, just come be with me. Come be with me. Come be with me. I'll teach you how to be unshakable, whether things are going great or things are, are, are not. Um, I'll, I'll show you who I am, right? Um, I'm reminded about the Zadok priesthood. <laughs> There's, I can't get into it now. I've run out of time. But, you know, the curse um, way back when in the Old Testament, look it up, Z, Z-A-D-O-K, the Zadok priesthood. The curse was for the priests who had disregarded God. They had disobeyed God. And you know what their curse was? They had to go do all the acts of ministry, but they couldn't come in close to the presence of God. And the Zadok priesthood had blessed the Lord. They had obeyed him. They had stayed. And God said, oh, you know what the reward is? You get to come close and minister to me. Just me. That's our reward. He is our reward. Amen? And I, I know for A-type personalities, right, who are driven. And Jen, I think you're probably one of those folks, just guessing. Um, right, God, it's not that God's trying to frustrate us, um, but he is trying to teach us that he is the ultimate reward. And that takes sometimes years and sometimes decades, right? It's taken me some decades to, to land there. Jody's saying each day the Israelites had to go out and gather more manna, yes, a type of Christ, and bread. That's right. He is the bread from heaven, right? That's what he says of himself. Kathy's saying, so good, Leah. Oh, thanks, Kathy. Marcia's saying, I love that we have assurance that God will never change his mind because he gave us both a promise and an oath. Ooh, yeah, I like that. We can have absolute confidence in our hope, an anchor for our crazy souls. Yes, amen. Crystal saying, a hope that entered into the inner place behind the curtain, meditating on this today. Who was doing that when the, when the author was writing this, right? It was the high priest of Israel entering into the Holy of Holies, and that only once a year. Jesus, when he dies on the cross, he tears the veil, right? That well, Go back and look at that in your gospel. He rends that veil, that, that thing that... Um, covered God and protected us ultimately. But Jesus, now that he has fulfilled every obligation of the law, he tears the veil and says, come in, come into me, come into the hidden place, the inner chambers of my heart. It's good news and more good news. Amen. So if you're, if, listen, I just felt like even when I was doing this last night, if you're bound, if you've been struggling and you're going, there's no fruit in my life as far as, you know, godliness as far as joy is, you know, the people closest to me do not see the gospel coming through my life, the good news coming through me. If that's true for you, hear me, I'm going to pray for you. Um, Father, I just pray for those um, um, brothers and sisters, God, who struggle to hear the hope in this message. I speak it as hope to them right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, in your goodness, I ask that you would point out you would point out these foundational pieces and that God, I just speak over that you would in your, in your quietness, in your gentleness, in the ways that only you can do point out, Hey, the whole building might be askew because of these pieces in your mercy. God do that for brothers and sisters who are so frustrated. God, they're just frustrated. They can't go in. They can't get out that God, I just speak your freedom, their, your promise, of, of life and, and life abundantly over them. And Lord, in your goodness, <laughs> oh, in your goodness, shake everything that can be shaken, God, in us. Do it now. Do it in this season, Jesus, that we wouldn't continue building something that cannot stand. So Lord, in your goodness, shake the things that we've, we, we've been working on and building on and that God either don't line up with, with you or, or just the wrong materials altogether, shake those things. And um, we know you do it because you love us. And if we hear your voice today, that means there's an invitation today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Sure love you guys. Woo, 10 minutes over. Love you. See you tomorrow.